My paper is the old is the old one out this afternoon because it actually turns back to this morning's session. So when I said this morning <laughs> that I completely agreed with Mark, I was not completely sincere. But I wanted to keep my, some of my powder dry. Hey, it's not so. <laughs> <laughs> um, because in Mark's book, Popper comes out on top. And I'm going to tell you a story that demonstrates that, uh, well, not that Hayek came out on top, but that Popper, following certain ideas of Hayek's, made a great mess of things. Now, Popper and Hayek have influenced each other's thoughts rather profoundly. Um, a positive inf influence from Hayek on Popper was in the field of evolutionary theory. Not the evolutionary epistemology, but Hayek suggested certain ideas to uh, Popper that Popper elaborated into a very interesting evolutionary theory. I've written about that, and if it interests you, I can give you the reference. I'm not going to talk about that now, because I'm going to talk about methodology, which is a subject that has been a bit, remained a bit in the shadow. And here, the influence um, by Hayek on Popper has been decidedly negative, extremely negative. And there are some very interesting and ironical uh, uh, aspects to this story. Now, before telling you this story, um, I'll also mention what one might consider as Popper's revenge. Because this is historically not correct, but in, after you've heard, you've heard my story, perhaps you'll, you'll, you'll understand better what I mean. Popper criticized Hayek's the sensory order, saying and writing right in 1952, after uh, Hayek had sent him a, a copy of the book. Could you please shut the door? that it, in his opinion, it contained a causal theory of the mind by which Popper appeared to mean a deterministic theory of the mind. And then he added, uh, I see some problems with that, but I'm working on a paper uh, that I will present at a conference in the Netherlands. And as a paper he, he wrote in 1953, it was published later. And in that paper, Popper argued that Hayek's theory of mind could not explain the higher functions of language. So apart from uh, uh, um, expression and communication, description and criticism, these are the four functions that Popper distinguishes in language. Now, poor old Hayek took this criticism so seriously that he sat down at his desk and started a, writing a paper that was never published. It was, it was never even finished. The title of the paper is uh, Within Systems and About Systems. And had Hayek published that paper, because he couldn't solve the problem, the extremely difficult problem, it hasn't been solved to this very day. Had he published that paper, I am almost convinced that Hayek would have justly earned fame as a precursor of artificial intelligence. So I'll, just to feed your curiosity, I'll leave it at that. But I can give you references uh, in case you are interested in pursuing that argument. Now let me turn back to um, what I would like to tell you today, uh, which is a story of a very strange story because it concerns the sort of back and forth of, 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 of influences of ideas between Hayek and Popper. But let me first start by asking a question. What do neoclassical economics, evolutionary theory, and mathematics have in common? Now, neoclassical economics, despite all the criticism that has been expressed on it, is still the dominant theory in economics. It's even the envy of, 
of the social sciences and notably of sociology because it has great explanatory power. Evolutionary theory, great explanatory power. Mathematics, indispensable in science. And nobody knows why. Now what these three, you can't call mathematics a theory, but let's say uh, what these three things have in common is there entirely, in the case of mathematics, or nearly tautological character of its basic theory. Neoclassical economics, uh, why, why are we here? Because we, in our utility function, we try to maximize whatever we want to maximize. And um, why are we here, not somewhere else? Because apparently being here uh, uh, creates more utility to us. So put this way, it's entirely tautological and devoid of content. Evolutionary theory, at least until recently, the survival of the fittest. Yeah. Why did we survive and, 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 and Neanderthal men didn't? Because somehow we were fitter than Neander the Neanderthals. Put this way, it's tautological. It's a problem. And why do these apparently tautological theories? Hayek uses, uses the term the pure logic of choice for the basic microeconomic theory, decision, rational decision theory. And I can understand why he does that, because there is a strong tautological ring to that theory. And it makes me even understand von Mises, who says, OK, then economics is a priori. He doesn't explain very well what he means by that. But by, according to modern logical standards, one thinks of being tautological, and has, as has been observed this morning, um, Mises doesn't accept empirical uh, criticism in order to reject the basic theory of economics. So there is a real methodological problem here. Now, Hayek in his early career adopted Mises' methodology. And he thought apparently perhaps without uh, thinking very thoroughly about it, that economics was somehow a priori. And uh, fortunately, um, he, he wasn't bothered by this, uh, for at least what it is to us, methodological problem, because he went on to develop his economic theory, the theory of the business cycle, his capital theory, which strangely, very strangely, have remained very much in the shadow. Uh, Hayek has been turned inside out by philosophers, um, 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 ideologues, politicians, political scientists, uh, political philosophers, but hardly anyone has taken his economics seriously. And I think one of the great resources still lie in Hayek's economic ideas. Not his defense of the market economy, but his highly technical theory of capital and his ideas on economic growth and the business cycle. Okay, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about Hayek's conversion, at least in his own idea, to falsificationism. Hayek read Logique de Forschung, the, uh, that was later translated as the logic of scientific discovery, and liked it. And being an intelligent man, even though Hayek is not a professional philosopher, he was by no means stupid, he noticed that the idea that economics was a priori or tautological could not be consistent with the idea that it could make empirical predictions, that in Popper's term, it has e uh, empirical content. So Hayek, again, sat down at his desk and wrote an, an article that has acquired a certain uh, fame called Economics and Knowledge, in which he explicitly tries, he explicitly addresses this problem. Wherein does the empirical content of economic theory reside? And that was a direct consequence of Hayek's reading Logik der Fossil. So Hayek, even before meeting Popper in person, was already influenced by Popper's falsificationism. Now, Popper was invited, or had himself invited, I 
I don't know the details of it, to one of the seminars that Hayek uh, conducted and organized at the London School of Economics in the 1930s, which, as far as I know, was the first time they met in person. And that is where he presented some of the uh, basic ideas that later went into the poverty of historicism. Now, Popper knew his mathematics. He had studied uh, uh, physics, but he, did, he, he felt very ill at ease with the social sciences, and in particular with economics. So Hayek came as a sort of uh, uh, pleasant surprise to Popper, because Popper finally thought that he had found someone from whom he could learn more about economics. Now, in New Zealand, um, he had already collaborated or asked a, a, an economist to, had to, to update him on economic theory. But Hayek exerted a decisive influence on Popper, not only on Popper's ideas about economics, but also on Popper's ideas about the methodology of economics. And I'll, I'll quote a passage from Popper to, to, to illustrate uh, uh, that what I'm saying is not complete invention. Popper writes in an article uh, that I will return to that was published in, uh, that in a paper that he had presented in 1963. It was published only later. Beginning of quote, my views on the methodology of the, of the social sciences are the result of my admiration for economic theory. I began to develop them some 25 years ago, so this is, uh, he, he says this in 1963, by trying to generalize the method of theoretical economics. And he adds in a footnote, I was particularly impressed by Hayek's formulation that economics is the logic of choice. This led me to my formulation of the logic of the situation, compare my poverty of historicism. This seemed to me to embrace, for example, the logic of choice and the logic of historical problem situations. The origin of this idea may, may explain why I rarely stress the fact that I didn't look at the logic of the situation as a deterministic theory. I had in mind the logic of situational choices, end of quotation. Now, um, I'll skip a detail. Um, but now what we witness here is something extremely odd and curious because first Hayek tried to introduce, to adopt Popper's falsificationism into his own Hayek's methodology of economics. And what he produced was the ideas that you can find in this 1937 article, Economics and Knowledge. And then Popper adopted this methodology that Hayek had proposed and made it the basis of his Popper's philosophy, methodology, excuse me, of the social sciences. Now, the consequences of this were disastrous because the 1963 paper uh, that is called, I'll give you the title, he presented it somewhere in the United States, uh, states, the title of this paper is Models, Instruments, and Truth, the Status of the Rationality Principle in the Social Sciences. Now, this article wasn't published until much later. What was published instead in 1967 was an abbreviated version of this paper translated into French and called La Rationalité et le Statut du Principe de Rationalité. So the, uh, rationality and the status of the rationality principle. Now, in this article, for which Popper has been rightly criticized, he says a lot of inconsistent things about the rationality principle that Popper thinks is or should be the basis of uh, social science explanations. He says, let me, let me see if I, can, if I can find the passage. Yes, okay. Now, what Popper says about the rationality principle, uh, which it's, it, it says simply that people act 
adequately to their problem situation. And what Popper says is that we should not tinker with this principle, but what we should change in case our explanation doesn't stand up to a test is the description of the situation in which individuals find themselves. Now, the in inconsistent things about this rationality principle that Popper says are, for instance, that um, well, it, he, he proposes it as a methodological principle, so not an empirical uh, statement. And on the other hand, there are different passages in the same article where he says it is empirical. Now, those two things are inconsistent. Then he says it, ha it has little empirical content. It is false, yet a good approximation to the truth. But it doesn't play the role of a testable hypothesis. Now, this is in stark contradiction to Popper's own falsificationism. Despite its falsehood, he adds, it must not be rejected or replaced by a hypothesis that is closer to the truth. So Popper entirely loses his orientation. No, you can react later. So where do these confusions come from? They come from, on the one hand, Popper's almost sense of, 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 of inferiority with respect to Hayek, particularly in the field of economics. And so he took over Hayek's version of Popper's falsificationism applied to the social sciences, re-imported into Popper's methodology of the social sciences, and Popper was so um, taken by this that he even went on to say, well, he said, well, okay, models are very uh, important in social science, and not general theory, but models. And by models, he means the description of the situation to which uh, you have to add something that makes the thing produce an explanation, which is the rationality principle. And after writing all these things, he even says that Perhaps even in natural science, models play an important role and falsifications are not as important as I thought previously. So Popper, even under the influence of his own re-importation of his own falsification, falsificationism eh, that Hayek had transformed into his own a methodology of social science, he even waters down the wine of his, I've been talking for 15 minutes, uh, the wine of his falsificationism. I wasn't telling you to. Oh, sorry, in, 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 in natural science. So, now, the irony of this all is, the biggest irony, because this is already very ironical, that, that by this, this is sort of. Uh, uh, mutual importation of ideas between uh, Hayek and Popper, uh, that this produced <laughs> Popper's me methodology of, of the social sciences. The greatest irony of it all is that Popper, Popper doesn't resolve all these problems. They were resolved by uh, Noretta Kirke. Noretta Kirke, in a couple of publications in the 1970s, tried to make the best of Popper's rationality principle, and she did so by considering the rationality principle as an idealized theory that may be made less idealized and closer to the facts by allowing that people in their assessment of, the, of, this, of their problem situation may make mistakes, etc., etc. Now, this actually takes further an idea that Popper never developed, he proposed it, but never developed it, n not even within his uh, philosophy of natural science. Because in a couple of publications uh, that were later collected in Objective Knowledge, Popper addresses or mentions the problems of idealizations, but he never works them out. Now, his own work, Popper's own work, contained the key to solving the problem of his own unsatisfactory methodology 
of social science. But it took someone else, Noretta Kurtgood, who knew Popper's work very well, to offer the solution. And idealizations in Popper's work are a completely underdeveloped argument, whereas in science, uh, in natural science and in social science, they're highly relevant. They're extremely influential and extremely important. Uh, so this very strange story demonstrates that um, Hayek's influence on Popper, at least in this case, was highly negative. It hasn't always, it hasn't been that, like that in all cases, uh, but um, for reasons that we may talk about later, uh, Popper, Popper just got lost no, I, I don't under the influence of Hayek. Now, okay. and then, uh, to return to, to, to what I, uh, in my introduction, I, I, I mentioned uh, Popper's revenge or a sort of poison pill. And the poison pill was this problem that Popper fed Hayek after he had published the sensory order that Hayek couldn't resolve, and thus Hayek lost the possibility of becoming famous as a precursor in artificial intelligence. Okay, I rest my case here. Have you finished, by, by the way? Or, yes. Or, yeah, I, I, it's, I it's, think it's, that's it, more it than It seems enough. to me that the, the importation is actually from one part of Popper's work to another. And that, that is from his initial take on historical methodology into the social sciences. In the uh, poverty of historicism in 1945, um, the uh, situational analysis and the rationality principle had purely been a method for, for um, interpreting history without ever establishing anything akin to a universal law for, for, uh, that, that would be analogous to, to the scientific method right. in, in natural sciences. Right. Um, by 1963, and that's precisely the year that you, you identify that, that uh, interesting paper, which is republished in right. the 1994 collection Myth of the Framework, and parallels the debate with Adorno that same year. Well, actually, it was 1961 with the debate, debate with Adorno. There is a transfer of that historical methodology that Popper had developed into the social sciences. The social sciences are analogized to historical methods rather than to natural science methods. It's not a reimportation of scientific method methodology from, from, Pop, from Hayek, but from a different aspect of Popper's own work. That, that would be my argument, yeah. at least. Well, let, let me, my, let my me say, is let me that does, doesn't change the matter at all, mm. because Popper actually expresses his gratitude to Hayek yeah. for uh, drawing his attention to the pure logic of choice, which he made first uh, yeah. in, in, after his presentation at the yeah. LSE, at the, the LSE yeah. seminar, right. the basis of poverty of historicism, right. and then went on to develop yeah. it into a methodology of social yeah. science. Uh, yeah. so it, I, don't, I don't see this as a criticism of my way of, of Well, let, let me go with two things. Let, let me begin, first of all, with the idea that, um, say, something like mathematics is tautological. Um, it, it may seem that way typically to um, some positivists, it, that was their position, but um, Kant, of course, thought that arithmetic was not tautological but a priori synthetic. Mill thought that the truths of arithmetic were inductive generalizations from experience. So this is a highly contentious um, subject that, that uh, actually I wrote my first book on uh, objectivity, rationality in the third realm, uh, justification in the grounds of psychologism. That was what psychologism was. The idea that logic and mathematics were empirical sciences. And this was something that Frege argued against, but it was certainly not, I, I, I think it would be just too simple to say, um, well, these are clearly tautological. Um, you know, people like Hume and Kant disagreed, people like Frege and Gödel. So, okay, so that's one thing. But the second thing, with that, that paper, because I spent a, a good deal of time with that paper, actually. Which, which paper? Uh, what's, what 1963 by Bill Yeah, Popper. and it's called Models, uh, Models Instruments, and Truth. Yes. yes. I have a paper called Truth, Rationality, in the, in the Situation, which was. Which I believe I sent to you. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that you know, it takes a bit of, um, 
explanation about this because it says so many things. Uh, Popper says so many things that seems to uh, many people to be, you know, as you put it, he's just lost his way. But, but I think that it, it's, it's really a way of finding what his way was. Popper thought that science, all of science, was concerned with explanation. I think he puts it in the, in the logic, uh, 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 logic of scientific discovery, I think. I think it's there. He said, we want to find explanations, true explanations if possible. It's interesting, true explanations. You want to find explanations. Now, explanations for him are going to be given through a deductive model. You have to deduce something. Why did so and so do such and such in this instance? Why did the, why did the string break, if, if you're talking in physics? There you have a natural law, which is a universal generalization. In order for you to have a deduction, you need a universal generalization. You need to deduce the action to be explained from a universal generalization and a set of initial conditions. But Popper doesn't think that there are, as it were, universal generalizations that are going to be laws of history. And he's explaining why somebody does something. Now, why do you have the rationality principle, which he says is false? I hold it on the status of something like a methodological principle. Um, if, the, if the explanation turns out to be falsified, better to blame the initial conditions than to blame, the, than to blame the, the, the rationality principle. Why? Because you don't have any rational explanation without it. The only thing that you can say without it is that it's irrational. I don't know why he acted. Well, that is, that's precisely it. He, without the rationale, sure. to say that Hitler is a madman, why did Hitler do what he did? He's a madman. May be true, but it's no rational explanation. It says, I can't explain it. Well, what, Popper is say, what Popper is saying, we may, we, may actually be, we may actually not be able to explain it's it. It's a rational explanation, but we don't stand to learn much from it. Can, can, can I bring in Jeremy and Bill, and, um, and then, then we go back to, uh, to, to Jack, if that's okay. Jeremy has his own mind. So. And uh, skip to Bill. Just a couple of comments, if I may, about your story. First of all, I think that while the story as you've told it is very neat, uh, there's something in it that isn't quite right. And what's not quite right is that the pure logic of choice was basically Hayek's characterization of the Misesian approach from which he was... Of what, sorry? Mises. It, I didn't, that, didn't that hear you. Of, the, of, of what was it? Of the approach of von Mises, from which he was then wanting to suggest we should depart in certain ways. So Hayek's paper became, in effect, a way of transmitting to Popper uh, the Misesian version of subjective maximization. What was transmitted didn't, I think, have anything to do with the falsificationist twist that, that, that uh, Hayek tries to give it in, in that paper. The, the second thing is that you could read what Popper is doing with regard to the rationality principle in that paper as a kind of anticipation of Lakatosh. That's to say that you could see him as suggesting that, and this, I've, um, it had often struck me, and I found actually in some correspondence that Alan Musgrave had, had made the point way back in a letter to Watkins. For what it's worth, the 1960, the, the um, version of the paper which was uh, published in the Rueff Festschrift uh, was extracted from the longer paper by one of Popper's research assistants. I think David Miller might have had a hand in it. Popper was never very happy with it, but what I would say just on historical grounds is that the um, English version of the extract was one of the things that was freely available in the LSE department. So certainly um, that 
existed in a kind of circulation um, well before the uh, the um, final publication of the uh, um, big version of the paper. Yes, Phil, may I react to it? Otherwise, I forget what oh, my okay. reaction is. Um, I completely agree with your second point. It has struck me too that it, the paper looks like a precursor of Lakatos. However, your first point is um, contradicted by what Hayek himself says, I think in a footnote to this 1937 article, but also on a picture postcard with a geisha on it that he sent me when I corresponded with Hayek, in which he says that um, this economics and knowledge was an attempt to invest, to, to get away from Mises, and Mises was actually annoyed, adds Hayek, to move into the direction of uh, empirical economics as theory with empirical content. So for Hayek it was progress, but for Popper it was a step backwards. Yes, but, but what I'm trying to say is that what got communicated to Popper was essentially the Misesian bit rather than the distinctive Hayekian bit. That's to say that, that the Popper's stuff on the rationality principle is a kind of odd ghost of the uh, views that Mises has in the English version in Epistemological Problems of Economics, where he wants to say we can use just one single model of subjective if you like, subjective mac uh, maximization uh, as a model which will cover all conceivable forms of human action. The oddity about it, though, is that Popper doesn't take it quite in that sense, because if it was in that sense, it would apply to everything, whereas Popper wanted to take it in a more substantive sense, and thus as something which in principle could be refutable. Can, can, can we bring a big guillotine down? Uh, um, Bill, just... Two, two okay, seconds, and then, and then we really have to give the, the mics over to, to Dave. I'm sorry, uh, we, we, are, we have gone way, way beyond the schedule. Um, we, we need to wrap this up by 6 o'clock for the, for the immediately starting... I'll, I'll be very brief. I, I did write a paper in 1994 called Testability in the Social Sciences in which I agree with you that Popper's ideas about the rationality principle were a mess, and in particular I propose that we can be predictably irrational which actually, since that article is like in 1984, since then, the whole field of behavioral economics has grown up, which attempts to do exactly that, to have predictive irrationality, so that it, when, when something is wrong, you don't necessarily change the model. You may want to change your model of human beings as well. Anyway, there's, there's a complication here. I think the rationality principle, I agree with you, is a big, uh, is very problematic and a mess. Sorry. Let, let me very briefly react to that and, and to Jeremy. Part, part, part. <laughs> my, 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 the negative impression that I've given of Popper, uh, there is an alternative reading because I put this question about what do uh, neoclassical economics, evolutionary theory, and lots of mathematics have in common. There is a real problem there that theories with a decidedly tautological feel to them apparently do have explanatory power. So Popper tried to make the most of this highly see, problematic and difficult situation. You see, this is, this is one of the things that I would say. A good part of that paper is arguing that science is about explanation, not prediction. He's distinguishing himself from the instrumentalists. We want to give rational explanations, true ones if possible. If you do away with the rationality principle, you don't have rational explanations. It's as simple as that. But, okay, I'm going to shut up.